This episode discusses care environments for those experiencing a mental health-related crisis. Please look after yourself. The topics discussed may be sensitive to some. If you or someone you know is struggling with thoughts of suicide or experiencing a mental health or substance use crisis, please call or text 988 to reach the National Suicide Crisis Lifeline. This episode of Between the Lines with FGI is sponsored by North Star Management Company. Smart builds start with us. They would do a feature on Look at the poor ER, it's inundated with psych patients. Here they are all stuck for days waiting for an inpatient bed. And they would always end that story saying, well, clearly they're waiting for an inpatient bed, so we need to build more inpatient hospitals. Back to you, Jim. And having been an emergency psychiatrist my whole career, it's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. That's like, if you come into a hospital and you're very short of breath and you've got an asthma attack, If we treated you like we treat the psychiatric emergency patients, we'd say, oh, come along in, sir. We've got a place for you in the back hallway. We're going to strap you down, and we're going to find you an asthma hospital in the next day or two. Keep breathing. We're going to take good care of you. That sounds ridiculous, right? But that's exactly what we do with psych patients. Welcome to Between the Lines with FGI, a podcast brought to you by the Facility Guidelines Institute. In this podcast series, we invite you to listen in on casual conversations related to health and residential care design and construction. Coming to you from Washington State, home to the fictional cast of the Twilight book and film series, is neither a vampire nor a werewolf, but FGI's very own John Williams, Vice President of Content and Outreach and the chair of the 2026 Health Guidelines Revision Committee. And coming to you live and in person from St. Louis, home to a farmer's market that's older than the actual Bill of Rights is Bridget McDougall, Associate Editor with FGI. And we're here because you have a lot of questions around the built environment and healthcare facilities. And while we don't have any answers, we know a few folks that do. The guidelines provide minimum requirements from a built environment standpoint, but there's more there between the lines, so to speak. And that's what we explore here on this podcast with the help of some amazing invited guests. And of course, you along for the ride. So thanks for finding us or coming back to us again. And let's get ready to read Between the Lines with FGI. Hey, Bridget. Hey, John. You know, we love to talk about words and acronyms on this show. That is true. I do love me some word talk. Well, today we've got some new concepts to go over here. During this episode, we're likely going to bounce back and forth between similar terms or some terms that maybe seem new and some terms that seem outdated. So I thought it'd be good to go over those and call those out before we begin. I think that's a good idea. All right. So to start off, 50 years ago, we'd be talking about psychiatric care a lot. And over the past couple of decades, we've transitioned that term psychiatric into mental health care and more recently behavioral health care. Yeah, that's right. In fact, in the 2022 edition of the guidelines, the word psychiatric was replaced with behavioral and mental health in almost all places after the revision committee sought input from the field about which term they preferred. But you're going to hear us and our guests kind of go back and forth and use both terms. And to be clear, there's still some discussion out there in the field, is behavioral health the right term? So another notable term or term swap is behavioral health crisis unit and the concept of EMPATH unit. EMPATH is an acronym for Emergency Psychiatric Assessment, Treatment, and Healing. And this model, the EMPATH model, was pioneered by our guest as an innovative delivery model to address psychiatric emergencies. That model is what led to the inclusion of the behavioral health crisis units in the 2022 edition of the Hospital and Outpatient Guidelines. During this episode, you'll hear us and our guest interchangeably mentioning both empath and behavioral health crisis units. You can think of it like Kleenex and tissues as far as branding and names go. Right. So 
Our guest today, Dr. Scott Zeller, was one of the pioneers of the Empath Unit. And in 2020, he was recognized as one of the top 10 healthcare design leaders by Healthcare Design Magazine. Also, previously, the National Council on Behavioral Health named Dr. Zeller USA Doctor of the Year. How cool is that? It's awesome. Dr. Zeller has served as Chief of Psychiatric Emergency Services at the Alameda Health System in Oakland, California, and is past president of the American Association for Emergency Psychiatry. Dr. Zeller is known across the nation and around the world as a leading expert in psychiatric emergencies. He lectures internationally as a keynote speaker, and he's authored multiple textbooks and numerous peer-reviewed articles. Dr. Zeller is currently an assistant clinical professor at the University of California, Riverside, and is vice president for acute psychiatry at Vituity. He's an incredible patient advocate, a pioneer, an innovator, researcher, and really just an all-around great guy. We are so happy to have him on the show today. Welcome, Scott Zeller. Hi, it's uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. So, Scott, behavioral health crisis units showed up as its own section in the guidelines in the really the last edition, the 2022, right? Tell us a little bit more about what these units are. The 2022 guidelines really were focused on something that was really an emerging concept within the hospital healthcare facility designs, which is Let's have a separate program, separate location for the behavioral emergency patients who are coming in emergency departments. We knew we had this situation that was all across the United States. In fact, all across the world, something called boarding of psychiatric patients. And what is that exactly? What happens is you have a lot of psych patients who come into ERs and then they get stuck there waiting for that elusive inpatient bed to open up. And when that happens, they can wait for hours, sometimes days, some outlier cases, even weeks, waiting for that inpatient bed to open up. And there's usually no trained mental health professionals working with them. There's usually little to no treatment. The only thing that might happen for them, they might get put in, uh, strapped to a gurney and placed in a hallway and told to wait there for uh, until a bed comes open. So they might get meals but they they aren't getting any intervention treatment or working with any professionals. The only thing that might happen is they might get a, a shot of sedation if they start getting unruly or noisy. That's especially tragic because to a point you've made before, these are patients who are experiencing a true emergency and needing treatment right away. Right. Federal law says psychiatric emergencies are medical emergencies, just like heart attacks or car accidents or what have you. So we should be treating them that way. The vast majority of asthma emergencies who come to the ER get better and go home in a matter of hours. You know, we can treat that asthma patient immediately with a nebulizer, with with some oxygen. We can get them breathing again. Well, guess what? It turns out that if you use emergency psychiatric techniques, the same thing's true for psychiatric emergencies. You intervene promptly. You get people in the right environment. You help them with the things that they need. And rather than just putting them in this waiting area, you actually initiate treatment, the great majority of them get better and can go home in less than 24 hours. So that's the approach when you're seeing this nationwide problem of why are all these people backing up in the ER waiting for inpatient beds? It's not build more inpatient beds, which is only kicking the can down the road. It's like, let's actually start treatment at the front end like we do with every other emergency condition. What kind of numbers are you seeing in regards to how many folks seek treatment in an ER for mental health emergencies? 20 years ago, one in every 25 patients in an ER was there for a psychiatric emergency, considered suicidal, acutely dangerous to others, very incapacitated, can't take care of themselves safely. Uh, All of those due to a psychiatric condition. That's what we would call a psychiatric emergency. In the years since then, the growth in the number of those patients coming in has just been astronomical. Just between 2006 and and 2016, the number of people coming to hospital ERs in the United States 
for reasons around suicide went up over 400%. Wow. And then it was only exacerbated by the pandemic. So that now one out of every seven patients in an ER is there for a behavioral emergency. And so the, the protocol from 25 years ago was the ERs were not set up to help psychiatric emergencies, but they were only one in every 25 patients. So they had a plan. We're going to see them. We're going to make sure they're otherwise medically okay. And then we are going to send them to a psychiatric hospital as their next step. And that's where everything will happen. So maybe that worked when it was one out of 25 patients and there was actually more psych beds than there are today in existence. Fast forward to now, the um, one in every seven patients, and there's actually fewer inpatient psych beds today than there were 25 years ago. So the math is not going to work. Right. The thinking behind the behavioral health crisis units then is that we can move these folks promptly out of the ER and get them to the appropriate care with the right personnel at the right time. The most common version of that is the empath unit. Empath is emergency psychiatric assessment, treatment, and healing unit. And what we've seen with those units, they're, they're created to be an extension of the emergency department specifically to work with these high acuity patients that otherwise would be stuck waiting for an inpatient bed. You get people into empath, those same patients who would have been waiting for a day or two for an inpatient bed, actually you initiate treatment with the right staff, comfortable therapeutic environment, 75, 80% of them get better and are able to go home in less than 24 hours. And that's a game changer for all the math of moving people from one place to another, the whole kind of ethics of how you're going to help people, the humanity of how you're going to help people. You were part of the revision cycle that saw behavioral health crisis units appear in the guidelines. How did that come about? As these units have become more widespread around the country, people at the FGI start saying, hey, we're building hospitals and they want to have empath units. They want to have behavioral health crisis units. We'd better start having some guidelines. So I think that's what led to it. And some of the most amazing people that I've ever met who were all very passionate about emergency psychiatric healthcare design and healthcare treatment got together. And that's how we ended up with the, the section in the 2022 guidelines. And to clarify, when you're speaking of empath units, and if the guidelines is talking about behavioral health crisis units, functionally, we're talking about the same thing. Is that right? Most of the time, yeah. In the uh, behavioral health crisis unit section, there, there's a couple of other uh, sections which can allow for a slightly different design than what we would call empath. So they wanted to make sure everybody was covered in there. But I think there was an overwhelming feeling among the committee that this is probably the best way for you to go. But if you absolutely decide you're going in this way, here's guidelines for that direction. So we've talked about how this podcast is really about the guidelines and the guidelines are about the built environment. Can you talk us through some of those physical environment aspects for this particular unit and how it might look different than another location that people are more familiar with? Yeah, absolutely. And it's one of the neat things about empath in general and just BHCUs from what we've seen. Everything is kind of situated around a central open environment, which is called the milieu. And it's a place where people are free to walk about Every patient can choose their own recliner, which they can sit up in and engage in activities, one-to-one therapy, group therapy, or they can fold it flat and they can take a nap. Nobody is restricted to that space. They can move all around. Some of our patients in in serious mental illness do better by pacing. That helps them to relax. That's that's okay on empathy. There's space dedicated so that people can move around. And there's never going to be a staff member yelling at them saying, hey, get back in your room, I'm calling security, which is a problem if you have that same patient in the emergency department, which you, you can't have them walking around and walking into the trauma surgery room or, or something like that. You know, it's just not set up for that. In what way? The typical ER is also more set up for people being in individual, maybe curtained off areas or different rooms. And... Because of the the surveying agency's guidelines and and the the suicide precautions, usually if you're there for a behavioral health emergency, you're going to have a sitter or a security guard with you at arm's length for the entire time you're visiting the ER. 
And you can imagine that that can be a little distressing as well. Certainly, you don't feel like you can do anything. You can't talk about anything you feel is too personal because there's this person listening. They're there uh, to prevent you from doing anything. Nothing against the folks who are being the sitters of the security guard. They're doing what they have to do. But if you're a patient, that's got to feel oppressive. It's got to feel like you're imprisoned, that you've done something wrong, and that's why you're there. Right. You change that to the empath unit, which is this big open room which is home-like, which is comfortable. You're free to move about. You've got staff that are intermingled. They're not there to be your security guards or your, or your prison guards. They're there to just be able to help you intervene whenever is necessary and are not going to try to tell you you can't do this or can't do that. It's more about making you feel comfortable, relax, and get you treatment initiated as quickly as possible within minutes after arrival. So that combination of getting that prompt evaluation, initiation of treatment, being in this comfortable therapeutic space tends to reduce all of the things that patients might do in an individual room, which is have paranoia or, or claustrophobia or, or think that everybody is against them and, and wants to fight against the treatment, fight against the meds, cheek the medications, not try to engage with the staff. And all those kind of things are going to lead to less likelihood of improvement. I've heard you speak to studies that show, you know, the percentage of people that that are able to go home in these types of units compared to hospitals to EDs. Yeah, so it's it's we it's amazing how consistent the numbers tend to be. It's usually somewhere between 70 and 80% of the folks who traditionally would have been held for an inpatient bed. If you get them into a BHCU, if into an empath unit, they, they're able to get better and go home in less than 24 hours. Wow, and that's impressive. Yeah, and that what also that does when we're talking about those other people who are waiting for that inpatient bed, suddenly there's that many beds open for them because you're not just a conduit moving people down you know, to the next level. You're actually only moving the people there that truly have no alternative. And that's better for... It's better for even for the inpatient hospital because they're not getting just a, a bunch of people and they have to pick and sort who really needs to be there after they're there. So even if you're anybody in that community and you cut yourself on your home bandsaw and you go in there, you're going to get seen a lot more promptly because we're doing a better job getting better care for the psych patients. And that's opening up beds. So it really helps everybody in the system, not just the psych patients. That's why we often say it's a win, 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 win. Yeah, 360 degree benefit there. You mentioned the big room, the big open room. And I think one of my initial reactions to the model when I first saw it many years ago was, what if something goes wrong with an individual and will that individual disturb others in that care? So um, it's such a great question and thank you for asking it. And you know, calming and de-escalation techniques for agitated, aggressive individuals has been like the number one thing of my research for the majority of my career. And if you ever want to see on uh, YouTube on how to do verbal de-escalation, there's a video of me doing it that is like at 500,000 views now, which I think is like close to Gangnam style in terms of popularity. <laughs> 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 A lot of the empath unit idea was designed around how can we minimize the chances for agitation and aggression, and if it does start to happen, how can we mitigate it so that it does not become something worse? And like you were saying when you first read about it, why isn't that place just a melee of fist fights and screaming? And you know, you open the door and it's almost like an old movie pie fights going on. You know, the pie wall, right? Uh, but everybody who's ever worked in an empath unit goes, oh my gosh, this place is magic. It's, it's quiet in here. It's like a library. It's like a church. How, how, is it, how is it so mellow? How is it so quiet in here? The design is such that staff are intermingled and the room is open without any kind of blind areas. And so that means that every one of our patients is fully 100% seen at all times by our staff members. And that's really important because when we go back to the same folks being in the ER, the Joint Commission CMS surveyors want them, if they're considered to be at risk for suicide, for example, they need to be within an arm's length of a sitter or security guard 
Why? Because they're in a room that's out of sight from the rest of the staff. And that individual placement in rooms is the reason that you have all these added security risks. And when somebody's in one of those rooms by themselves, whatever else is going on outside there, they're not able to see what's going on. They can't get anybody's attention. If they hear somebody laughing or, or doing something like that, they think they might be talking about themselves. All their symptoms get worse. None of their needs get met. They can, they can go for hours before getting somebody's attention just because they want a glass of water. And that's a dynamic that, you know, as you pointed out, is a direct result of the fiscal environment. You change that dynamic by putting people in the big open room. You have a station where they can serve themselves beverages, snacks, linens. Suddenly they don't have to beg a staff member to get them a blanket because they're cold or a cup of water because they're thirsty. They can do it themselves. We also know that doing things yourself is a way to mitigate agitation and aggression just as, as well. It helps you to regain control because you're making your own decisions and you're taking care of yourself. Though All those things help to reduce your feelings of anxiety, aggression, anger. The other benefit of that open room is that staff can immediately notice if somebody is having that tougher time. We have other rooms associated with that big room, like a quiet room. So if, if someone's having a crisis, we can move them in there. What's your experience with things like that? Do those quiet rooms and seclusion rooms get used much? We want all the staff working in empath units to be well-trained in de-escalation and kind of noticing those warning signs. And then when they do that, one of the staff can immediately go and, and go right up to patient X and say, hey, patient X, you're... Uh, it looks like uh, you know, maybe you want to come over here. We could talk about something going on. looks like something might be on your mind. And if it's uh, a little something more, it's like, hey, we've got a couple of these, what you were calling quiet rooms. I think we're now more calling calming rooms where they're unlocked. This is not a punishment. It's not a cell that you're put in like the tr more traditional secure holding rooms were. This is a room that uh, you're going in there voluntarily. And maybe it's even got some cool things in there, like instead of traditional chair, maybe there's a beanbag chair that you can kind of like crash into. Some of them have cool um, lighting and sound things that you can control yourself uh, or even videos that are playing. And you can just go in there and kind of chill out for a bit. It's a place to be in temporarily to kind of get you through that little rise of agitation, anxiety, anger that you might have had. And then... You know, the staff member can go in there with you and help you with the de-escalation, or they can just say, hey, do you want to just hang out in here for a bit? Again, it's only a temporary room. You don't get to stay there forever, but it's supposed to be a place that you can go and decompress. Does patient restraint ever enter the picture here? I mean, that's different than a quiet room or a calming room, whichever you might call it, right? Technically, in most of the BHCUs or empath units, we would still have the capability to convert into that secure holding room or what you'd call restraint or seclusion room. But because you have this alternative, these unlocked rooms, it turns out that the vast majority of them do better in that. You don't need to lock them in. You don't need to tie them down. The same population that in a typical emergency department, involuntary psych patients, 20% of them would end up into physical restraints in the ER. The exact same population, you move them to an empath unit, you're talking one or two out of every 1,000 patients goes into restraints. Wow. It's a difference between 200 out of every 1,000 to one or two out of every 1,000. It's all about that different environment, recognition, intervention, and having a place to go that's not coercive. And all those things together end up with these great, great outcomes. It really speaks to how important this physical space is and these particular rooms. I, you know, if I were agitated and there's one room there called a quiet room and I walk into it and in it is a bed, I don't care how comfy it looks, and I see straps, you know, and I'm told that this is the, this is the place where I can just take a minute to, to calm down and chill out. That's, um, that's not conducive to de-escalation. A little trauma-inducing there, maybe. Yeah. That's such an excellent point. Yeah. No, we always have uh, that say that the, the restraints need to be kept elsewhere. It only takes a couple minutes to attach them if that's absolutely what you have to do. But you're right. We talk about something in, in, in behavioral health care 
called trauma-informed care all the time. And we talk about it for a long time, but one of the basic tenets of it is, is that the, the great majority of the people who are undergoing acute mental health care have had traumatic experiences in their lives. And let's not try to resurrect those. And what, the, what you just described is a perfect example of that. If you've been in restraints before and you, uh, you go into a room and they say, hey, look at this room, you're going to be able to like chill out. In. And the first thing you see is a bed with restraints hanging down. I mean, I think that would frighten the vast majority of people. You know, we talked last episode and the one before about the functional program and just really understanding the use of the space before you talk about designing it. And I'm looking at the guidelines where we talk about in 2022, it's called the quiet room. And you're right that in 2026, it looks like we're in revision right now, but it looks like it's going towards being called a calming comfort room to capture the industry's terms right now. But we say in it, you know, it shall be provided for a patient who needs to be alone for a short period, but doesn't require a seclusion room or secure holding room. And we say that it should have a minimum clear floor area of 80 feet, and it should be permitted to serve as a consultation room, but nothing more than that. And, you know, that's really up for the facility to decide what it looks like. We don't say, don't put a bed in here with straps, you know, and restraints. And we don't say, make it as cold and uninviting as possible. <laughs> and we don't we don't say that stuff. So it seems like that's a time during that functional program when folks are designing this space to get the input from people like you who can help inform what these spaces should look like for the, the purpose and the patient clientele, the population, patient population. Well, you, you make such a good point because the environment is, it makes such a difference. And, and it's just stunning to me how sometimes people haven't gotten that. And, you know, when the empath model was first getting, uh, getting around and people were asking about it, looking into it, this was uh, about eight years ago. I remember being invited to some hospitals where they would show me a, uh, a kind of a, a room in the next to the boiler room in their basement that that was about twelve by twelve and dark, and they'd say, "Hey, look, maybe we could use this as an empath unit," you know. And I was like, "Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's probably you know their idea was just let's get them somewhere and shove them in there, you know." So it, it's probably not a secret to anybody who'd be listening to this that when we're talking about the average hospital, the mental health department is one of their lowest funding priorities. It is what it is. I've been, uh, you know, in this profession for getting close to 40 years now, and it, it's just, we understand it. It's not a glamorous uh, area of healthcare. There's a lot of stigma involved with it. You know, you open up a new psychiatric program, sometimes they don't even want a ribbon kind of ceremony because we don't want people to know we have that here. <laughs> you know, they're, they're worried about it. Yeah, unfortunate, but true. Wow. Bearing that in mind, a lot of the idea behind BHCU's empath more specifically was how can we create a program that's going to include all of what we know of emergency psychiatry and all the benefits of that, but making it something that's scalable. So any size hospital, any size community, any type of hospital, whether it's academic or community based or uh, you know, remote, rural, you're, uh, rural, I'm sorry, or, or um, you know, downtown urban, that, that the basic philosophy would hold true, but you could adapt it to those different sites, just like we do with any other kind of departments of hospitals. We have different kinds of labor and delivery units, for example, that make more sense for whatever community or type of hospital they're in. And how much better is that than a place that's got nothing? So we start with the idea that most places have nothing. And can we create something that's relatively easy to create, has minimal investment type things? You don't need a lot of specialized equipment or a $2 billion machine in there. It's just going to be this kind of simple alternative space that you're going to have some real benefit. So about how many of these facilities do you see across the country at this point? So, because some of them don't call themselves empath, although they admit they're the empath model, but they came up with a different name or the state licensing said they had to have a different name, it's a little hard to count them sometimes, who qualifies based on the definition. What we pretty much can be confident in saying now, there's several dozen that are operating 
right now. And we know that there's just off the top of my head, I know of another 40 to 50 that are in development that are about to be built. The state of California gave out 11 grants of $3 million each specifically to build empath units. All of those hospitals are working on doing it now. Not to be outdone, the state of South Carolina gave out 13 grants of $3 million each. Those just went out in the last couple weeks. And so there's going to be, you know, 13 new empath units there, 11 new grant hospitals in California with empath units. But I know of four other units, hospitals in California that are building empath units who didn't even get the grant. We just heard that the state of Georgia is making a big impetus. They just came out with a statewide report saying that empath is their number one recommendation for improving mental health care in the state. I think we're going to be seeing, I think by the end of two or three years from now, we're going to have more than 100 in the U.S. And then maybe it's like the old commercial with, and she told two friends and don't want <laughs> She told two friends. <laughs> so um, in the hospital document, it's located in, Chapter 2.2, Specific Requirements for General Hospitals. And in the outpatient document, it's located in Chapter 2.8, Specific Requirements for Freestanding Emergency Care Facilities. And in that outpatient document in location, it says that the Behavioral Health Crisis Unit shall be permitted to be part of the freestanding emergency care facility or a separate standalone facility. Can you speak to that a little bit about where these things are and where they should be? Yeah, it's a, it's a real mixed bag out there how people are creating crisis facilities, how they're creating psychiatric emergency facilities. I think one thing that's been important that we've been realizing in the last couple of years, and I think there's even a movement towards within the FGI, is kind of differentiating like hospital-based uh, location, which maybe should be called a behavioral emergency unit because they're treating the same level of emergencies for psychiatry that the ER would be treating for shortness of breath or low blood sugar or losing blood or trauma or something like that. And hospitals don't have orthopedic crises, they have orthopedic emergencies. So so maybe psychiatric emergencies are the ones that are in the hospital setting. Then you have this whole wonderful world of behavioral health crisis units that are created in freestanding or in community operated, or a county mental health department will operate. And those are fabulous, wonderful programs. And it's all about a spectrum of care that sometimes, let's say you're a a high functioning, intelligent, employed, housed, got a family, but you just had, you know, a spouse pass away. You just lost your job. Horrible thing happened to a family member. You're at wit's end, you really need to talk to somebody. It's not like you can go, you know, stop in somewhere and get a counselor or something in, in through your insurance company. But if you have a, a county or behavioral health crisis center that you can go to, that's the most amazing thing. And, and what, and they have trained professionals there to help you. Now, is that the same level as somebody who needs to go to the ER? No. And we would rather they go to that community level. And it's the same kind of spectrum. Like we have, Medical urgent cares, like maybe there's that urgent care center that's next to the Walgreens. You don't want to go there if you're in a plane crash. But if you've got the sniffles, maybe that's a good place to go. And then you reserve the ER for the plane crashes and the heart attacks and things like that. It's the same thing with behavioral emergency units like Empath, which are hospital-based. They work in tandem with an ER. They're they're part of the same campus. They're They're all integrated. And then a freestanding crisis program, which are wonderful, but really set up more for people who can live in the community and and they don't need to be hospitalized. They don't need to be confined at that point in time. And it's just like, again, it's at different levels of acuity. That's the way you have to think about it. There's no one size fits all for anything in healthcare in general. And also in psychiatry, it's the same thing. So we want something that's really good for those standalone Uh, crisis facilities, and hooray for them, where they've got trained counselors. And if you're at wit's end, that's a great place for you to go, where the ER might be a pretty bad place for you to go. But if you have just taken a massive overdose to kill yourself, it's a much better thing to go to the ER where they can treat that overdose and then get you the psych care that you need rather than going for counseling because um, you need to get that overdose treated. I know there's a real push for the 2026 document during this revision cycle to 
clarify and separate out what these facilities are, where they are, specifically in the outpatient document to show that there's, you know, the community-based, as you mentioned, ones attached to a freestanding ED, ones that are that are separated out, and pulling that text and clarifying that text into a different chapter, which is chapter 211, which is for facilities that, for behavior and mental health patients. Yeah, no, and I think it's a good thing, and I'm, I'm really glad that that we're doing that. One of the things I find when I'm out there working with communities, working with hospitals, working with government agencies is a general benign ignorance. I don't think there's anything like evil or wrong of these people who don't understand it, but they, they, they have a tendency to think a psych is psych is psych. And, and it's all the same. And it's not. It just, just like I was saying, the difference between a medical urgent care and a trauma center, there, there's a big, huge difference there. You know, if you have a, a, a lifelong, serious, debilitating disease like schizophrenia, which is a horrible illness you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy, you know, what happens with people with that? Like maybe you're uh, hearing auditory hallucinations to kill family members, and they're not imagining that. They're actually the part of their brain that lights up that would light up you listening to me right now is lighting up in their brain, telling them to do awful, awful things. And we can help them, we can intervene with them, but that may not be going to a drop-in counselor because that's a much more acute, serious, and potentially life-threatening condition. So we want to have that different level. And then there's people who are having, you know, they're, they're very frustrated with life or they're having symptoms of dysphoria or, or, you know, they're having personality issues or maybe they need referral for situations going on with family interactions or, or all these different kinds of situations. That's a great level of care too. Maybe that's a much larger bandwidth of people that, that are, are going to be able to help with that. But just like we need like the intensive care unit for people coming in who are, who are having sepsis or are having really bad cardiac disease, we need a different level for that really severe psych conditions and then this other area for, for these other uh, situations. And explaining that to hospital leadership, government leadership can often be very, very difficult where they say like, well, it just all sounds like the same place to me. And it's like, no, hopefully the way I just described it, there is just some dramatic differences between different levels of acuity in mental health situations. So it sounds like there's this parallel track, not only of, of trying to help people imagine how to build these spaces, but there's a fair bit of public education around what these spaces are and maybe updating that social contract of everybody knows to go to the emergency room when, when you're having an emergency, but an urgent care when it's not necessarily emergency, but socializing that, that concept of the difference between emergencies and urgencies, I guess, in, in the behavioral health world. Yes, and also helping them to understand that it might cost more to operate an emergency center than it does to do an urgent care center. So don't think that they should all be reimbursed for the same you know, patient care. There was a wonderful article that was written last summer in the New Yorker magazine about empath units. And the author uh, of the article was a physician himself and clearly really uh, liked what he saw with empath units. He went and visited the, the, one, uh, the wonderful empath unit at the University of Minnesota. But he had a passage in there in, in his article that, that I still use and I actually have printed out and I put on my wall. Uh, and it's exactly about this topic. And I'm paraphrasing him because I can't remember exactly how it went. But uh, what he said was, you know, those of us as healthcare providers, as physicians, we usually think of treatments being medications, devices, surgeries. But we need to realize that the environment can be a treatment too. And that's the beauty of empath. So powerful. Yeah. At the heart of the Hippocratic Oath is, of course, first, do no harm. And what you're talking about is looking at patients that are really suffering in a way that we can't always see. And the idea of putting them in a space that's not the best space for their healing is doing harm and nobody wants that. So we really appreciate you coming on today to talk to us about the physical environment spaces and how patients presenting in a state of crisis can be helped, not harmed. Well, thank you for having me. And what great questions and understanding it's so nice to talk to people who you clearly get it. 
when I'm talking about it. And it's not just a blank look on your faces. So it, it's been an honor and a pleasure to be able to, to discuss these with you. Well, the lack of a blank look is entirely due to the fact that you make what can be a complex topic so accessible. So we really thank you for that. Definitely. Thanks again, Dr. Zeller. We'd love to have you back at any time. And thanks for joining us for this episode of Between the Lines with FGI. Do you have an idea for an episode? Get in touch with us by writing to podcast at fgiguidelines.org. Yes, please do. And as always, if you're interested in becoming a sponsor for one of our episodes or a series of episodes, you can also reach out to us at the same email address, podcast at fgiguidelines.org. Thanks to Neil Kane and the Neil Kane Trio for the use of his song, Skip to My Lou, from the album of the same name. Join us next time as we go between the lines with FGI. Bye, Bridget. Bye, everybody. Bye, John. Bye, you all. See you next time.